Well, we've come to our final lesson of the study of the divided kingdom. We knew where it was going when we started, that it would end with the fall, but still kind of sad as you think about the glory days of Israel and then the division and ultimately the fall of the north and then 135 years later, the fall of the south. So we'll finish up tonight. And then remember, because the first Wednesday of July is observed during VBS, we'll go right into new classes, Sunday and Wednesday, uh, next week, Lord willing. So there's uh, material on the table in the foyer, so you'll be ready class in here on Wednesday will be the class on emotions taught by Matt Adams and Brandon Starling and then in the small classroom on Wednesday will be the Song of Solomon with Eric Phelps and Steve Bachmiller all right let's go ahead and bow and we'll get started one last time Our Father, we thank you for being the creator of the earth and the sustainer of life and the one to whom we can call in times of joy and times of sorrow and times of anxiety. And we thank you especially now for this hour of study. We pray your blessings on us and all our classes tonight and our teachers and our students. We thank you for the word you've given us and the mind you've given us that we can understand and reason. We're thankful for the example of the Old Testament that you've preserved for us. Help us to learn from it that we may please you and follow in the footsteps of our King, Jesus Christ. And we pray in his name. Amen. Well, I want to begin tonight with uh, the last question that was from lesson number nine which was the lesson on Josiah so the last good king of Judah and you recall we talked about all the reforms that he did and how he turned things back to the law and then they celebrated the Passover and uh, question number five from that uh, lesson was why do you think Josiah was so diligent to bring about reform when he knew that God had already decided to punish Judah so we're studying the fall of Judah tonight and God had already said that wasn't going to be stopped so why would Josiah carry out all those reforms and do those good things knowing it wasn't going to change the outcome. Tony has the answer. Okay, Tony says it's still the right thing to do. Don't you like that? We don't serve God because of what he will do or will not do for us. We don't serve God in anticipation of receiving something. We do it because it's right and because he's God. And that ought to be reason enough. Very good. Yes, Garrett. That's a great point. Garrett said those going into captivity, those who'd be carried off, it would still be a good influence on them and they would know the right thing to do and they would have appreciation for the law. Good. Somebody else? What's that? Paul's point. Oh, yeah, Glenn. Ah. All right, very good. So Glenn said that there are occasions in the scriptures where God does change his mind. Think of the words of the king of Nineveh when Jonah came to preach 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And the king, of course, declared the fast and they sat in sackcloth and ashes. And here's what the king said. Who knows? 
God may relent concerning the calamity he said he would bring upon us. So God may change his mind. Very good. All right. Anybody else? Yeah, Bruce. So his, uh, Bruce said, Josiah first turned to the Lord with all his heart, soul, and might. And uh, in so doing then, that would determine the direction of his life. And that's going to be a, a, a big selling point in the fall and how things then changed so quickly after the death of Josiah. All right, so uh, let's talk about the... Uh, curses that God said would come upon Israel if they did not obey him. And this is all the way back to Moses before they're entering the promised land. You remember Deuteronomy 28, the first half is all the blessings. If you obey me and keep my covenant, these are the good things that will happen to you. But if you do not, These are the evil things that will come upon you. And I want you to see the specific things God identified even before they stepped foot in the land. All right, so uh, the Lord will bring a nation against you from afar as the eagle swoops down. Now, who is referred to in the prophets as an eagle? Anybody remember which king of the nations is likened to an eagle. Nebuchadnezzar. And so all the way back here, it's, it's being identified. This nation whose language you shall not understand and he'll have no respect for old or show favor to the young. And we see those very words in uh, the chronicler's depiction of the fall of Judah. Also in Deuteronomy 28, then you shall be left few in number. Now, what's one word that we would use to describe few in number when you think of uh, captivity? A remnant, yeah. So you shall be few in number, whereas you were as numerous as the stars of heaven because you did not obey the Lord. So the promise to Abraham, Abraham, the great nation, you'll become few in number And then verse 68, the Lord will bring you back to Egypt. Now, what is Egypt here a kind of a metaphor for? We know they didn't literally go back to Egypt, but when he says you'll go back to Egypt, what is that a reference to? All right, they're going to go back to bondage or captivity when they're carried off to Babylon. So I don't, I don't want you to think this just came upon them all of a sudden and poor old people of Judah didn't, didn't know this was going to happen. It went all the way back to their beginnings and still they did not keep the covenant with the Lord. When we think of uh, captivity and what we'll see tonight is that this happened in three stages or three groups that were taken away to Babylon. And here are the dates and the kings who are on the throne when these happen. Now with each date, even though you see multiple names there, that's just different names for the same individual. And what happens is he has a name that he goes by in Judah, but then the captive king changes his name. He gives him a different name, kind of like what we saw with Daniel and his friends once they were taken to Babylon. So these are significant dates in the history of the southern kingdom. And then notice the groups that we read are taken. So first, in this first deportation, there's the ruling class and the royal family. So why would Nebuchadnezzar start with that group, the, the princes, the uh, royal family, the nobles, why would you start by taking away that group of people? 
Jerry? Okay, so Jerry said you take away their leadership and their ability to, to reorganize. There's a hand back here. Yeah, Coy? Oh, okay. So by taking away their leaders, then the king can appoint his own people who will lead. Yeah, Dub? Okay, he stole your answer. Yeah, Brandon? Okay, yeah. As we see that in uh, Daniel 1. with So Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, though they were part of that first group taken. And now Nebuchadnezzar is going to use them to serve in his court. He's going to teach them how to be a Chaldean. And then they can uh, bring honor to him as captives. So this first group was literally a decapitation. You're aware, I'm sure, that on the night that Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, that there was also a plot to kill the vice president, Andrew Johnson, which the guy chickened out. He didn't go through with it. And also to kill the secretary of state. Now, he was injured, but he survived his wounds. And so that was an attempt by the Confederacy to decapitate the Union. And that's what happened here in this first deportation. Then uh, we read that uh, in the second wave, 10,000 total were taken, and these were all the workers. Uh, they're called the mighty men, so they'd be part of the army, the craftsmen, and the smiths, along with these, specifically we know Ezekiel and then uh, Mordecai in the days of Esther. Now, uh, in the small class when we taught this same material, uh, the question was asked, well, why didn't he just take them all at once? Why didn't just, you know, just rip the Band-Aid off? Why go through three different uh, deportations? And each time, Nebuchadnezzar would have been content. He appointed, for instance, in 597, he appointed Jehoiakim, and he would have been content with just letting him rule. And th this will be a nation that pays tribute to us. They pay taxes to us, but just leave them alone. They can govern their own affairs. But Jehoiakim rebelled, and so then he came in this third wave, and there he takes the professor and Marianne, the rest, rest of the people, and this time he's not coming back. He destroys the temple and the city walls, burns all the houses. And, of course, the only ones left are the poorest of the poor. Now, the thing about uh, the Babylonians, they did captivity different than we saw with Assyria in the north. They did not disperse the people into different parts of the empire. So they were literally taken to Babylon, the city. And we see in the days of Esther that there was essentially a community of the Jewish people. And that, of course, would allow them uh, to be sent home. And under the decree of Cyrus in 606, that's exactly what happened. And then, uh, as Coy said, the king would appoint, instead of re-inhabiting the land that he had conquered as the Assyrians did with other people, he would appoint a governor then to oversee the, those left over. And so the significant thing there is God's people were never self-governed again. Here they had this great empire and the, the kingdom of David. And now until Jesus comes, of course, to claim the kingdom, They'll, they'll be subservient to a Gentile ruler. All right, comments or questions? That's just an overview of what we'll do tonight. Okay, well, let's look at these final kings then. So all of our uh, passages uh, are going to be in 2 Kings, starting in chapter 23. We'll, uh, we'll not go to 
Chronicles. I know on, on some lessons we've kind of gone back and forth. Uh, but since Kings, remember, is the one that tells why they'd gone into captivity, you can go ahead and put your marker there. We will look at a couple of the prophets to, uh, to, to add, uh, add some context. All right, so after Josiah dies, he dies in battle, and his son, Jehoahaz, has a very short reign, three months, and the significant thing about him is it said that the people took him and made him king. And so he was not the oldest son of Josiah, which was usually the, the heir. And it is thought that he was, a, he was appointed by the people because he also would have been against Egypt. And so because of that, the king of Egypt, or Pharaoh, comes and takes him captive And he dies in Egypt, and he uh, appoints Jehoiakim. Now, he is the older brother of Jehoahaz, so he's not the son with uh, just reigning three months. He probably didn't have time to have any heirs. And so here's another son of Josiah, and he reigns 11 years. So let's pick up the reading in 2 Kings 23 and verse 36. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Zebedah, the daughter of Padeah of Rumah. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his fathers had done. In his days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up, and Jehoiakim became his servant for three years, then he turned and rebelled against him. So, a couple of things to notice there. Number one, when it says that Babylon, or Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came up, that is to indicate that they are now the ruling empire. They've conquered the others, and so he, Nebuchadnezzar is, is essentially the ruler of the near eastern world and when it says that Jehoiakim was his servant that just simply means he had agreed okay we'll we'll pay taxes to you 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 don't hurt us and uh and we'll give you tribute yes sir correct All right, so Glenn says before this time, Judah was paying tribute to Egypt for protection. But now they've, they've agreed, uh, at least at first, to support Babylon. But then it says he uh, rebelled against him. In verse 2, the Lord sent against him bands of Chaldeans, bands of Arameans, bands of Moabites, and bands of Ammonites. So he sent them against Judah to destroy it, according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken through his servants, the prophets. Surely at the command of the Lord, it came upon Judah to remove them from his sight because of the sins of Manasseh, according to all that he had done, and also for the innocent blood which he shed, for he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, and the Lord would not forgive. What is that a reference to? Back to, all the way back to Manasseh, that's the grandfather of Josiah, and it says that he was killing innocent blood. What was Manasseh doing that had so incurred the wrath of God? Who remembers? All right, he was causing his sons, remember, to pass through the fire, which was uh, just a way to describe child sacrifice. And God had noticed this. And he had become aware of innocent blood. I would just say to those who are uh, as disturbed as we should be about abortion 
and innocent blood being shed, God knows. He's taken thought of these children, and he will mete out the scales of justice. We're going to do what we can as citizens, but ultimately God is the one who will uh, bring vengeance. So take, uh, take comfort in that. Just like he saw the shedding of innocent blood here in uh, the days of the fall of Judah, so he has in our day. Why do you think there's the emphasis here on these things are happening according to the word that God said to the prophets or this came about to fulfill what the Lord said. Why is there the emphasis on that in these verses, do you think? Say again, Brandon. All right, so it shows that God is, is faithful to his promise. But, but think about in the, in the terms of people of, of this day, your, your nation has been conquered by another nation who serves other gods. What might you be tempted to think about your own God? Oh, man, their God must be stronger than ours. Our God couldn't defeat their gods. And so as they're being carted away, said this is exactly what God said would happen. And just know God's the one who, who gave power and authority to Nebuchadnezzar. We see the same thing. Keep your place here, but look in Daniel chapter 1. Daniel being a prophet during the exile. Daniel 1 and verse 1, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. So that's very clear there, right? As the book starts, it was the Lord who gave his king into the hand of the Babylonians. Yes, Garrett. All right, so, uh, so Garrett makes a good point that if, if it is so that life begins at conception and uh, the soul is uh, there when life begins, then, then heaven is going to be full of these uh, innocent children who were taken before they were permitted to come to the earth. Good. Brother Hyde, I, I preached right through you holding your hand up a moment ago. Do you remember what you were going to say? Okay, good. No, I was just thinking that if we read the Old Testament and God's Word, and what I come away from it is God is in control. He's always in control. He needed those nations of Babylon and so on to be to punish his people. He, he uses people. He uses evil people to accomplish what he wants. Uh, Judas. <laughs> you Judas. So, uh, and, uh, and some places said that uh, God's work, when it goes forth, it will accomplish that for which it was sent. And it will not return up to him boy. So it's either you believe or disbelieve. But, you know, it's just a There it is. Way of demonstrating of how God is in control of creation. He's using these other nations and sometimes wicked people to carry out his purposes. Very good. Yeah, Matt. All right, 
excellent point. So uh, rather than God just giving up on them and leaving them to themselves, Matt says that captivity was a form of God's love and mercy driving them to repentance. And when they came back from captivity 70 years later, they were a different people. They didn't, uh, they weren't tempted by idols. That had all been removed by this uh, punishment. So God did that for a purpose. Yeah, Coy. Okay, that, what a great point. Even Nebuchadnezzar thought that he was the one who had built his empire, and that's when God humbled him and made him walk like an animal or live like an animal for a time. Very good. All right, so this is that first wave, that first deportation with Jehoiakim. All right, so now we have the son of Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, or Jeconiah or Kaniah. Let's read about him in chapter 24 and verse 8. Jehoiakim was 18 years old. See, he, his father reigned 11 years, and that allowed for an heir to come of age. When he became king, and he reigned three months, now we're back to this pattern, in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Nehushta the daughter of El Nathan of Jerusalem, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father had done. Let's just stop there and notice this is why the reform of Josiah didn't take. I mean, they, they carried out the king's wishes by tearing down all those idols and s serving the Lord, going back to the law, but it wasn't wholehearted. And uh, for the last time, let's just think about this statement again. The divided kingdom was the result of a divided heart. And, and the people didn't serve God with their whole. So here are Josiah's ancestors. So these are two of his sons and a grandson, and they're all doing evil. And as a result, the people followed them. Verse 10, at that time... The servants of Nebuchadnezzar, of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, went up to Jerusalem, and the city came under siege. And Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came to the city while his servants were besieging it. And Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, went out to the king of Babylon, he and his mother and his servants and his captains and his officials. So the king of Babylon took him captive in the eighth year of his reign, and he carried out from there all the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house and cut in pieces all the vessels of gold which Solomon, king of Israel, had made in the temple of the Lord, just as the Lord had said. And he led away into exile all Jerusalem and all the captains and mighty men of valor, 10,000 captive, captives and all the craftsmen and the smiths. None remained there except the poorest people of the land. All right, so here's the second deportation and uh, Marilyn was telling me before class today that she was doing the daily Bible reading and hearing about all those beautiful things that were part of Solomon's temple and all the gold and all the handiwork that went in to making this house for the Lord and now piece by piece is just being torn away and you have to think that Nebuchadnezzar's reasoning was, well, if you can't pay me your tribute, I'll just come take it out of the temple. I'll just come get all that gold, all those uh, treasures and, and articles that you have there, and that'll be my tribute. And so he takes away now the working class, all the blue-collar men, all the tradespeople. And so you see the, the cities becoming more and more destitute, and takes the king captive. And now Nebuchadnezzar appoints the final king, Zedekiah. So each name that's underlined on the screen, those are all sons of Josiah. So now we have Jehoiakim's uncle. He didn't have any heirs. So Zedekiah is appointed and let's read about this final king starting in verse 17. 
king of Babylon made his uncle Madaniah king in his place and changed his name to Zedekiah. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king and the he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Hamatal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord. And this came about in Jerusalem and Judea until he cast him out from his presence. And Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. So he too could have been a king who ruled over this little remnant that was left. But now he too has rebelled, and so Nebuchadnezzar comes and finishes the job. Verse 1 of 25, it came about in the ninth year of his reign, on the tenth day of the tenth month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came. He sent all his army against Jerusalem, camped against it, and built a siege wall around it. So the city was under siege until the eleventh year of King Zedekiah. On the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine was so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. The city was broken into. All the men of war fled by night by way of the gate between the two walls beside the king's garden, Through the, though the Chaldeans were all around the city, and they went by way of the Arabah. But the king of the Chaldeans pursued the king and overtook him in the plains of Jericho, and all his army was scattered from him. And they captured the king and brought him to the king of Babylon at Riblah. And the sentence was passed on him. And they slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes and put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him with bronze fetters and brought him to Jerusalem. So this is the final act. The uh, city is completely destroyed. The walls, remember, are torn down and burned and, of course, the, uh, the temple is laid waste. Now, one of our questions for today's lesson, and we won't take the time to read it, uh, verses 8 through 21, but there's great detail about all that happened to the temple. So the question is, why do you think so much detail is given or so much information given about the destruction of the temple? Why would that have been such a significant event in Judah. Yes, Larry. Okay, so... Larry said the temple was the meeting place of God among the people. Glenn? Go Rubio up here. Okay. Uh, the, uh, Glenn said the temple, even through all those evil kings, had still been there and remained there. There had been the uh, semblance of God being among the people, but now it's, it's to illustrate he's, he's not with you in this place anymore. You've been removed, and because you've not served the Lord there's, there's no place for God to meet you here. And it would stay that way for 70 years until that first wave came back under the direction of Zerubbabel. And that was the first thing they did was they rebuilt the temple. Before the walls, they rebuilt the temple so that they could once again have a place to worship. Uh, we won't take the time to, to read those verses from Lamentations. It's, uh, it's just a picture of how, how desperate times were when the Babylonians had besieged the city. It talks here about parents 
uh, boiling their children so that they could have something to eat and uh, just just destitute because of the famine and uh, it all began because they had decided they weren't going to serve God and keep his covenant so easy way to remember the final king starts with a Z Zedekiah and then they've gone in so that's the third wave there into exile one of the things we've tried to do during this uh, study of the kings was plug in the prophets so that we can in our own minds uh, think about which prophet uh, goes during which time and the easiest way to do that is to think about the prophets in three separate groups and it's in relation to the exile or captivity so you have prophets that are pre-exilic that is before captivity and then you have prophets that are considered exilic because they prophesied during captivity and who's my bible scholar that's going to guess this third category what do you think it is post-exilic all right so let's start plugging them in so Obadiah and Joel those are the early ones now we looked at these three during the reign of Jeroboam the second in Israel when they had reached kind of their final zenith and from there it was downhill so these prophets came in to warn about destruction we looked uh, during the reign of Hezekiah at Isaiah and Micah and then uh, just during this last period uh, these three prophets and again you, you read the first words of these prophetic books and they're going to tell you it was during the days of Josiah. Now in exile we have these three prophets. And I put Lamentations there because it was written by Jeremiah. And then of course after the exile Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. So on the screen here are 17 of the 39 Old Testament books. So if, if we can just in our own minds think about where they fit in biblical history, that's a huge chunk of the books that we now have a better understanding of their times and place. So 17 out of 39. And of course, during this time, there were also prophets who, who don't have a book named after them. We called them oral prophets, people like Elijah and Elisha. All right, so uh, last thing I want to do is talk about now God's promise for a reunited kingdom. If, if we just finished the Old Testament with this deportation to Babylon, and that'd be a pretty sad story, wouldn't it? I mean, that would just be pretty depressing that everything ended by God's people being carried out of the promised land. But thankfully, the story doesn't end there. I just want to look at three three times God tells about them being reunited. In Hosea 1 and verse 11, the sons of Judah and the sons of Israel will be gathered together. So notice the language there. They've been scattered. He says, I'm going to bring them back. I'm going to gather them together again. Jeremiah, in the passage about the new covenant, he says, I'll make one with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So no longer a divided kingdom. Now they'll be under one covenant. A covenant, remember, that's of the heart, of a united heart. And then finally, Ezekiel says, I will unify them into one nation on the mountains of Israel. One king will rule over them all. And who will that be? Yes, the Messiah, Jesus. No longer will they be divided into two nations or into two kingdoms. So God will bring them back together and one kingdom will be established and they will all pay tribute and homage and serve with one heart one king all right comments or questions as we close here yes sir
and talks about Jesus uh, cleansing the temple. And of course, uh, there he also refers to himself as the temple. Destroy this temple and in three days I will rebuild it. So think of that. Jesus now is our access to God. He is how we are uh, with God. He is, he is our way to God as our priest and king. Very good. Anybody else? Yes, Carl. Carl said I, I should have just read one verse and sat down. We wouldn't have had the last 40 minutes. No, he, he, that's Second Chronicles 36. What are the verses? 15 and 16. Yeah, that summarizes the whole end of Judah and, and why God did what he did. Very good. All right, we'll stop there if that's all. Thank you so much for your attention and participation and your interest in the divided kingdom.
Good evening. Our first song this evening will be 136, You Are My Strength. It'll be 715 in the song, but we're using that. Number 715, You Are My Strength. The invitation song this evening, if you're using the songbook, will be number 287, number 287. The song before the invitation will be 596. 596, His Grace Reaches Me.
Good evening. It's a pleasure to be with you on what is a pretty nice Wednesday evening for what it's been. Last week was a bit of a difficult week. I had been assigned to work at another store and I was leading a team and well, to be honest, it wasn't the easiest job I had ever done. And so I was under a lot of pressure to get a lot of things done right. And Friday evening, I decided I would go take a trip to Tomball to go visit my girlfriend Riley and my good friend Titus. And so after everything that had gone on, I finally got to relax. And after finishing dinner with my girlfriend's family, I was driving over to my friend's house and I was taking the back roads through Magnolia and Tomball. And all throughout the sky, I saw lightning. And it wasn't upon me. It wasn't right here. It was far, far away. But I could still see it light up the sky. And I had tall trees all around me. And yet it still lit it up as day. And I got to my friend's house, and he's right up next to a big field. And I got out of my car. I didn't even get my bags. I just walked up to the field. And I got to gaze across the field and witness the most spectacular show I have ever seen. I could barely hear the rumbles of the thunder, but that lightning took up the entire sky. And after overcoming such a, a difficult week, to be able to relax and witness the wonders of God's creation, that was peaceful for me. If you would, I'm going to read from Psalm 77. Psalm 77 is a psalm that I thought of and I did some reflection on after the fact. And if you'd like, with your kind attention, I'd like to read all 20 verses at this time. Psalm 77, beginning in verse 1. I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and he will hear me. In the days of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. When I remember God, I moan. And when I meditate, my spirit faints. You hold my eyelids open. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I consider the days of old, the years long ago. I said, let me remember my song in the night. Let me meditate in my heart. And then my spirit made a diligent search. Would the Lord spurn forever? And will he never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? Then I said, I will appeal to this, to the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember the wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O God, is holy. What great what God is great like our God. You are the God who works wonders. You have made your might known among the peoples. You, with your arm, redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. When the waters saw you, O God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trembled. The clouds poured out like water. The skies gave forth thunder. Your arrows flashed on every side. The crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Your lightnings lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was through the sea, your path through the great waters, yet your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. And, and so here the psalmist doesn't go into detail with his troubles, but you can see he is troubled. He says he's stretching out his hand without wearying. He is waiting on the Lord. And then he begins to make a diligent search, wondering if the steadfast love of the Lord has ceased, wonder if God has forgotten to be gracious. But he goes on to say, no, I will appeal to this, and begins to glorify the Lord, and begins to detail all the mighty, wondrous deeds the Lord has done. And so when I am troubled, and when I am going through a tough time, I have to remember that the same Lord that causes earthquakes and hurricanes is the same Lord that wants me to accept his mercy. The same Lord that wiped out nations 
is the same Lord that extends a hand in graciousness. The same Lord who I sometimes don't always feel is near is the same Lord who wants me to be with him in heaven one day. And so when I have troubles, when I feel low, when I feel alone, I need to look across the field and see that God is there. To see his wondrous works and his mighty doings, I know that the Lord is near me. The title of this psalm is, In the Day of Trouble I Seek the Lord. Am I seeking the Lord? Or am I allowing my troubles to get to me? Am, am I allowing earthly pleasures to distract me? I should be seeking the Lord in my day of trouble. The Lord is steadfast. He is unmovable and never changing. He is the same Lord yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And so I have faith when I say this, that if you are going through trouble, the Lord is there for you. If you have any need that needs to be fulfilled, the Lord will be there for you. If you're ready to begin your journey with God tonight, or if you have troubles and you need the prayers of our congregation, now is the time to take care of that as we stand and sing. Well, we're grateful for Austin and for Ethan and leading us in our service tonight. We're thankful for our visitors. We have a number who are here with us tonight. We extend a warm welcome to you and hope you can be with us on the Lord's Day. We're going to make our members aware of just a few things before we're dismissed, and Jason Kroon will be leading our prayer to dismiss us. Hopefully you saw the networks that went out about Norma Bowman in addition to her recovery from the pacemaker procedure. Uh, she's learned that her wet uh, macular degeneration is now in both eyes. And so on alternate months, she will have injections in both eyes. She had one today. And so uh, let's pray for her as this could be some uh, discouraging news for her and uh, pray that all will go well in these injections. Janet Byers had some tests uh, done on Monday and the results were favorable. We're thankful to report that. David Tomley is out of the hospital. So that's earlier than expected. Now he is going to stay in the Birmingham area for several days while he does his checkups uh, but we're grateful to report that he's doing well in his recovery from open heart surgery. And uh, Giles Baker has several different appointments this week, and uh, let's pray for him as uh, he goes through these. Kevin and Lori O'Banion are in town. We're
grateful that they're able to be here at this time. On uh, next Wednesday, even though it will be the first Wednesday of July, we will have classes. So the first Wednesday will be observed during the week of VBS. We'll meet in here on the Wednesday night of VBS. And so uh, teachers uh, be prepared for classes next Wednesday night. And for the adult classes, there's still some material so that you can be ready to go on the Lord's Day for the new classes. There are still uh, sign-ups for VBS for volunteers, and then next week, Lord willing, we'll send out a registration for children for their classes for VBS July 17th through 20th, 10 to 1130 a.m. Anything else to announce while we're all together? Yes, Greg. Greg, Devin Costa is going to have a procedure a week from tonight, did you say? And uh, is a bit anxious about that, so let's remember her in our prayers. Thank you, Greg. I know with the uh, 4th of July approaching, there are several who are going to be in and out and traveling, and so uh, let's pray for one another and check on one another that uh, all will do so safely. Let's be standing now as Jason comes to dismiss us. Let's pray. We give you thanks, Lord, with all our heart. We are glad and we rejoice in the singing that we've had tonight. We give you praise, our most high God. Lord, we approach your throne and want to give thanks to those that have recently been baptized this past week. And we're still mindful, Lord, of the lectures that we had this past week. Let us keep reflecting on those words that we may be encouraged by them. And we also pray for those that led those lectures and that we can pray for them and their continued work in their congregations. We pray for the work that's coming up with the VBS. We're thankful for the visitors that are here with us tonight. And we pray for our members, Norma and Jan and David and Giles and Devin and that we pray for their comfort, their healing. We're thankful for the good reports that we've had. And we pray for those that have upcoming procedures. And those that are traveling and those that will be traveling here soon, we pray for their safe trip to and from. We pray this, Lord, in your son's holy name.